Tonight, we welcome all of you to the house of God for Bible study. James in the second chapter. And as you're turning there, we're going to be picking up with verse number 10. We made it through verse number 9 last week, where he talks about having respect of persons. And a respect of persons is not, he's not talking about respecting someone in the right way, but showing preference towards someone for personal gain or advantage. As a matter of fact, the other half, another half brother of Jesus, Jude, talks about those who have people's admiration for advantage. And so here in uh, James, he teaches the same thing in more detail. And so we talked about how that if we show preference toward any one group of people for personal advantage reasons only, then we can be, we can be guilty, even as Christians, we can be guilty of showing respect of persons or preferential or favoritism treatment. And so he's not, he's not, uh, he's not dealing with showing preference for the right things. Now, even God, shows preference for the right things. Paul writes in Hebrews 11, verse 6, that God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. He's a rewarder of them who diligently seek Him. That's Hebrews 11, verse 6. And so God shows preference also. Okay, God shows preference because God is more serious with those who are more serious about Him. As a pastor, I do the same thing when I see those who want to get closer to God, who want to be more involved in the house of God, I tend to walk more closely with them and in more mentorship with them, trying to help them become better men of God because I see that they are hungrier, so I feed more to those sheep that are hungrier. So does God. That is not the wrong preference. The wrong preference, and we taught this last week, so we're not going to reteach it too much, but the wrong preference, as James is teaching, showing preference to the rich rather than the poor, so that your church can get some money out of them. That's what he was dealing with, by the way. He's, talking, he's, he's writing to a church. He's writing to some Christians in a church. But we also brought out uh, people who are of the same nationality. If you only hang out with those of your nationality, those who speak your language, then you can be guilty and probably are guilty of showing preferential treatment. So it isn't, and I also said, you know, it's not about, joking around and laughing in a different language. You know, you can do that. People do that. But when you're obviously excluding everyone, okay, that's what he's dealing with here. So it isn't about having preference for things that are good, such as diligence and commitment. It isn't that. It isn't even uh, having fun and you know, excluding others to the point where you're just having fun for a little bit, but then you go back to the general public. It's when there are those around you and you're sitting there and obviously not talking to anybody but your favorite person or people. Now, good luck to any preacher who tries to get this completely out of a church. It's never going to happen. But we are supposed to teach it anyway. And the Holy Spirit has to do the rest if he's allowed to. So that's what he's been dealing with up to verse number 9. So now we're going to pick up verse number 10. But before we do, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for the Bible study, for your word. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that the word of God is hard hitting sometimes. We need that to help keep us in the narrow way. We thank you. We ask you to help us in Jesus' name. Amen. And so he was hitting hard last week, James was, and he keeps hitting hard, but we're going to hit hard in love because we want to be built up, we want to be uh, edified, we want to be perfected. Sometimes, and being sharpened and perfected takes a little bit of cutting, amen, it takes a little bit of friction. But it's all, it hurts so good, as has been said. So verse 10, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So we're going to get to our text here in just a moment of, what, of where we get our title. But our title tonight is The Power of Faith and Works Working Together. The Power of Faith and Works Working Together. And we're going to talk more about that here shortly. So he says here, if you keep the whole law, if you mess it up even one time, talking about the Old Testament law, he said, You're, you've broken the whole law. And that really gives some insight into the perfection of God's holiness. 
that you cannot break God's law even once. Because you can keep 99%. If you mess up 1%, you messed up the whole 100. That's the way God sees it. God's perfection and holiness has not changed in the New Testament. He's still the same yesterday, today, and forever. I know that says that about Jesus in Hebrews 13, but it means that about God the Father too. God the Father is just as holy tonight as he was all the way back when he wrote the old, when he, whenever he inspired the writers of the Old Testament to write. He's just as holy. It's just that he has shown grace and favor to us by the sufferings of the one he gave to die for us, Jesus Christ. And so God's holiness is still perfect and he still requires perfection. But because he found it in the life of Jesus, he now lets us be perfect in our hearts rather than the keeping of a law. But we are still supposed to be perfect in our hearts. What does a perfect heart look like? A heart that obeys the Lord, that grows, that develops, that learns to walk closer with the Lord and obey the Lord as it learns. That's a perfect heart. And so here in verse 10, if you keep, if you, even if you keep the whole law, you break one, you're a transgressor of the whole law. Generally, okay, one more thing we talked last week. Generally, people who exclude, every, who exclude others because they have their favorite group do this because they're insecure and they need tribal acceptance. James calls it right out into the open because the best way to defeat darkness is with more light. Okay? And light is truth. Darkness is Ignorance, lies. And so therefore, he's just calling it right out. And so ought also we. So uh, then James takes us into the deeper theology of God's holiness. We talked about that, how that God's word is meant to be kept. It always has been. His holiness has always been righteous and perfect. But God has always made a way for men and women to be perfect. Going all the way back. I mean, with Adam and Eve, he created them perfectly, so they had absolutely no excuse. But he even told Abraham in Genesis 17, verse 1, be perfect, walk before me, be perfect. Perfect in his heart. When you have a perfect heart, your actions will be more and more perfect as you live for God. Verse 12, so speak ye and so do. Okay, make sure your, your words and your actions line up. We're going to talk more about that in a moment. Which he actually did talk about it in chapter 1, there in uh, verse uh, 22 about not being hearers only because you deceive your own self. And so here in verse, chapter 2, verse 12, he says, Speak ye and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. So now he introduces a new phrase here, a new law, though it's the same law. He, say, he calls it here the law of liberty. And so in the Word of God, you have the law of Moses, you have the law of love. You have the law of liberty. And this law of liberty is the life that you live now that you've been made liberated in Jesus. You are at liberty. Not to sin, but you're at liberty to be perfect as God requires. God does not require perfection to an extent that we cannot meet it. He only requires it to the extent that we can meet it. When you're in Jesus, you can meet it. You can meet that standard. And so here he says, now make sure you're speaking and make sure you're doing things, knowing you're going to be judged by what you do. As God's people, we've got to have the long-term picture in mind. Most people, I don't know the percentage, you hear 95, 90%, 95%, 98%, whatever it is, it's really high. Most people live their lives in reactionary mode. They're just, alarm clock goes off, oh, got to get up. Late for formation, got to run, whatever the case. They're always in reaction mode. God teaches us all throughout the Word, here's just one point, Make sure you look ahead and see how you're going to be judged and live now according to that. He gives us ample preparation time. Verse 13, For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. 
Many times people who claim Christianity will say and do things that are certainly not backed up by the Bible. This is because God does not judge them immediately like He did in the Old Testament. Now God did show Himself quite more real in the Old Testament with physical signs and wonders. But God also killed people instantly in the Old Testament. <laughs> so do we want to be in the Old Testament? See, a lot of times people think, oh, I'd love to see the, I'd love to see all that stuff. I'd love to see the fire and the, and the cloud and the, and the fire fall down and the water out of the rock and, you know, manna and all, all, they'd love to see all that stuff, right? But if you, if you're going to go to that time frame, you got to take everything that comes with that time frame such as the earth caving out from under people and swallowing them alive into hell, you know, stuff like that. Hailstones falling from the sky and, and killing people, you know, things like that, right? Vipers crawling in and biting people, you know, stuff, things that God allowed. You can't just go and do the, see the good stuff. Besides, the Bible makes it clear that even though they were there seeing those things, many of them did not believe. So would we really believe? Jesus says, if you have to see stuff like that to believe, he said, you're wicked and perverse. Because you're sensual, you're basing things upon what you see rather than faith. He said, you will not see anything. And James said, uh, he said what? About a double-minded man, we're not there yet, but a double-minded man, he said, they're not going to receive anything. They're not going to receive anything from God. All right, so the law of liberty. This law of liberty is the liberty you and I have to walk perfectly before God. It is not a life that is too hard to live. It is a very liberating life. So he does not always approve, or rather, God will give us liberty, but let's learn how to walk in the liberty of God to where he will approve of our lives. God does not always approve of things he allows. He said earlier, God doesn't smite people dead instantly, but that doesn't mean he's okay. When we hear the Word of God taught, when we read the Word of God, when we know what the Bible says, God does not approve of us just because it doesn't kill us for disobeying. Thank God for His mercy, but there is coming a point at which our time runs out, whenever that may be. The power of faith and works working together. What is the power? The power of faith and works working together is the ability to live above and outside of and superior to the power of sin which used to control us, to live in this life like Jesus lived. Now that sounds like a tall statement, but with God all things are possible. Let this mind be in you which is also in Christ Jesus. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's possible. Jesus was not perfect before the Father because he kept the law of Moses. As a matter of fact, he broke some of the law of Moses <laughs> when he was allowing his disciples to eat with what well, wasn't even the law. But he broke a lot of the laws, I wouldn't say the law of Moses, but he broke the laws of man when he would not make his disciples wash their hands 20 times before they ate. They were eating with unwashing hands. And he said, you break the law of God with your laws. So you don't need more laws, you need more liberty. You need more love and, per and perfection in God. But I, I will say that, I, I was about to say, Jesus broke the law of Moses. He didn't break it, he fulfilled it. You don't read of Jesus offering animals. You don't read of him doing that. And I asked a man one time, I said, uh, why didn't Jesus offer sacrifices? Well, because he was the Lord. I said, but people did not see him that way. See, we look back and we say, oh, the Lord, they, they should have known better. Well, the Bible says if they had known better, they wouldn't have crucified him. But it's easy to say now they should have known better. But you got to take a trip back in your mind to that time frame. Imagine some guy just comes on the scene busting up all the paradigms and busting up all the ways things have always been, the way we've been doing it for centuries. And we're just supposed to say, oh, that's the Lord. We're, that's, that's not likely to happen. Okay. All right. So that James shows us the way God looks at being unmerciful. He said you will not receive any mercy if you're not merciful even if you have a good reason not to be merciful. You know, the worst reason is what? A good reason. Because it makes us think we're all right. This does not even mean people deserve mercy. He said what? You will not get mercy if you don't show it. He didn't say only show it to those who deserve it. He didn't say show it to those who show it to you first. That's juvenile. That's underdeveloped Christianity. 
Matthew 5 and 7, Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. Sounds to me like James learned a little bit from his older brother. He said, you will not receive mercy if you don't show mercy. Bite your tongue if you have to. He said, you got to show mercy. Verse 14. What doth it profit, my brethren? He's still talking to Christians. What is the profit? Though a man say he hath faith and, hath not, and have not works, can faith save him? Think about that question. Can faith save him? Now that right there completely slaps in the face the doctrine, just believe in God. Or when people say, I believe in God. Verse 15. If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say unto them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. So which one are you supposed to have, faith or works? Both. Option C. It's like one brother. <laughs> you know, I try to teach people to, to think beyond the... Uh, what's going on here? There we go. I try to teach people to think beyond the options that are in front of them. you got to be able to see another option if it's there. you got to be able to see another option. And someone asked me, because he noticed some things needed to be fixed in the church van, and he knows how to fix them. He said, he said you want it, uh, what did he say? He said, you want it done at a shop or you want to save money? I said, option C, I want it done right. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, he said, I know how to do that stuff. I said, like, you do? He said, yes. He said, I know how to do a lot of things like that. I know how to do, to do that kind of thing. I said, okay. I said, well, just give me some information then. We'll talk about it, you know. And so, but you got to be able to see option C, okay? So which one do we need? Which one are we supposed to have, works or faith? Option C, both. All right. Well, that wasn't one of the options. I know if I don't like the options, I'll create an option. All right. So what does it profit? If you talk a lot of things, but you never do them. A lot of people have a lot of offerings of, advice and a lot of offerings of corrections and criticisms and things that could be better and why doesn't someone do this and how come no one does that and you say well what about you oh no it's like where's the works where are the works see that's just that's just talk he said earlier so speak and so do i told you my rule right if you come up with you if you bring a problem to me you got to bring at least two options Got to bring at least two. And you got to be part of how many? Two. Bring me three. You got to lead at least one. You got to, one of your options is, is you're going to lead it. Another option is you're going to at least be part of it if you don't lead it. And the other option would be really good if I'm not going to include you. All right. Like super, like Jesus is going to do it for us type of thing. All right. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to go with options one and two. Because I believe if you're going to bring a problem, you should bring solutions and then you should be part of the solution. This is not kindergarten church. Okay, this is this is warrior. This is the four people I've wor I pray for: winners, worshippers, workers, warriors. I pray for those four categories of people when I pray for God to draw people. I don't just say God draw people to the church. I don't. That's so generic and vague. Believe me, there's some people I don't want in this church. So I'm not praying generic because God may let them come, and I'm not, I don't want them here. All right, church just has a way of drawing the weird, kooky folks. It just does. All right. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is like a big net and it drags in all kinds of stuff. He said some things you throw back. <laughs> he said some of it you keep and some of it you throw it back. And so when I pray, I pray for winners, worshipers, workers, and warriors. Amen. And God has brought those kinds of people. Some people fall into all the categories. Some fall in one. Some fall in two. Some fall in three. Either one, whatever. As long as they're able to be worked with, I can work with them. But I always require someone to bring solutions that they're part of if they're going to criticize. I'm open to criticisms in a respectful way, but you got to bring the solutions too. Why? Faith without works is dead. Criticisms without solutions is also dead to me. All right, let's keep going. We got all that out of what? Be you warm in the field or something like that. So even, okay, here it is. Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. I tend to, if I find a problem, I try to offer solutions as well. 
They don't always get taken, but that doesn't mean I'm not doing my part to try to offer them anyway that I'm part of. Our relationship with God cannot just be words. It must be actions also. It cannot be a profession without practice. Otherwise, we don't really believe what we say we believe. We don't really believe what we say we believe. There's a lot of things that Pastor Former teaches, but I believe them. And I back them up with actions. Verse 18. Yea, a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. James is not teaching that you can earn your salvation through works. That is not what he's teaching. But he's also not teaching laziness couch Christianity either. And that's another thing. People who say, oh, you're just, say, you're just legalistic. You're saying that you can work your way to heaven. So I'm going to sit here on my couch of do nothing and eat my Christian Cheetos and Doritos and whatever else and expect to get into heaven with cheesy fingers. I don't think so. You're going to have to get up and do something with that Christian life that God gave you. It isn't difficult, but God requires something. What is that something? Well, it's in the Bible. So he says here, you have faith, I have works. Eh, we'll just agree to disagree. That's not what he says. <laughs> You're busy for God, I'm not. We're both saved. James is saying, are you saved? A true mark of true salvation, or as Paul says, things that accompany salvation, is that we will be busy about the Father's business just like the Lord who saved us. So he's not teaching that you can earn salvation, earn heaven. You cannot. He's teaching that you will get busy for God. Doing something. Verse 19. Thou believest there is one God, thou doest well. Good job. You know there's a God. That goes back to what I said earlier. When people say, oh, it's okay. I believe in God. Look at what he says here in verse number 19, if you're following along. The devils also believe and tremble. Let them know you ain't any better than a devil. What do you mean? The devil believes in God. The devil believes in God. Is the devil going to heaven? Are the devils going to heaven? But they believe in God. It takes more than belief in God, doesn't it? Well, I believe in God, yes, but I don't have to go to church. Well, you're, you're disobeying Hebrews chapter 10 at that point. And you're fulfilling James chapter 2, verse 20. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? He's asking, do you even want to know what you don't currently know? You know, some people make you believe in predestination. Because <laughs> you teach them something and they act like they just don't even get it. Like, huh, what, huh, what, uh, okay, anyway. It's like, did you even hear what I just said? Did, did it even click? But the way some people act, you may, it, I don't believe in predestination. What is predestination? Some, some people believe that some people are predestined to go to heaven no matter how bad they are, and some are predestined to go to hell no matter how hard they try. Doesn't matter, that's not the Bible. You will earn heaven, you will earn hell. But some people make you believe in predestination. I'm just saying. <laughs> like, man, maybe there is a predestination and maybe they're one of the ones that are just destined for hell. Who knows? They just act like they ain't getting anything here. Or is it purposeful ignorance? Okay. Well, that can happen too. Some people don't want to grow up mentally. They want to act nine like they don't understand what's happening in life when they really do. There's a story my, one of my former pastors told me years ago. When, I think he was a, a traveling evangelist. Yes, he was. And he was he was preaching in a church, and there was a woman there that had this. She was a uh, mentally disabled, mentally disabled, and she was getting a monthly check for it and all that. You know, and that's fine for for people who have that issue and all that. He said that um, the pastor she wanted prayer that God would help her. You know, there was prayer preaching about healing. The pastor and and this man who used to be my pastor, he was an evangelist, evangelist at the time. They went and prayed for her. And she, and they, uh, the way he told it, he sensed that God's power was there to heal her. And they were just simply saying, hey, just start speaking. Start speaking, pray in tongues, rebuke that spirit that's kept you bound, and that she was, it looked like she was about to do it. And then she just slumped back over and played 
And they just hey, are you okay? And she just did this the whole time. And God dealt with his heart and said, she wants to stay the same. Because she doesn't want to lose that money. She wants to stay the same. You get a lot more sympathy when you don't when nobody expects anything out of you. Well, you get some sympathy from some people, depending on how quickly they see through it. But anyway, she liked the sympathy. She liked the money. She wanted to stay the same. See, she had asked for prayer, but when it came time to make a decision, it's like James here says, do you even want to know? What did Jesus say to the man in James, or rather John chapter 5, by the pool of Bethesda? Do you want to be made whole? All right. We know Jesus healed him, but we don't read anything after that. Well, we, the man said, you know, I have nobody to put me in the water and all that. And then God, the Lord said, get up on your feet. Okay, and he healed him. And then he got up. But we don't know of any other dialogue other than that. J Jesus simply told him to get up, and he did. But he first asked him, do you even want? And a lot of people don't want. So James is saying what? Will you even know? James is saying, I, I'm putting it clearly, do you even want to understand? The answer for most people is no, I do not want to know what I don't currently know. Because they don't want to be held accountable for it, but they will be. Because we'll be held accountable for that which we could know, whether we learn it or not. If God has put a minister and a pastor in our lives who teaches the Word in a church building where we can legally gather, Multiple times a week, we could know. James was just calling it like it is. He was going right through the excuses. Do you even want to know? Rhetorical question. He knew the answer. Verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? The answer to that is what? Yes, he was justified. He's, he's going back into their scriptures. And he's giving them a real life Example. Now, I believe a lot of them were like, Yay, Abraham, the man. Okay. Well, what did what made Abraham the man? His works. His works that were rooted in faith, that were a fruit of his faith. So he said there, isn't that what made Abraham justified? Was his works? Verse 22. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works or together with his works and by works was faith made perfect in other words do you not see how that when he put works and action with his faith his faith was even more perfected what is the power of work of faith and works working together your faith becomes perfected whenever we do nothing with our professed belief when we do nothing we will do nothing, and we will have nothing. It is usually those people who can never, ever, ever get the victory in their lives. They're never happy. They're never joyful. Their head is always down. Their face is always drooping with sadness. They're always telling you all their medical woes and all their what marital woes and all their mental woes, the three M's, medical, marital, and mental, all right, because they have no power. Why have they no power? Because they do not do what the God of power says. So what is the power of faith and works working together? The power is the power of God working in your life and perfecting your faith. I'm telling you, the more action you put with your faith, the more works you do, the more working for God, the more power you'll have, the more perfection in your heart toward God you'll have, the more perfection toward people you'll have, the more on fire and joyful you'll be. We poison ourselves. Verse 23 of James 2. And the scripture was fulfilled which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed or credited unto him for righteousness. The scripture was fulfilled. Whenever you and I put actions with our faith, meaning we say we believe what the Word of God says, we go out and do something with that, we will fulfill the Scripture also. What Scripture? That we will be perfect even as our Father which is in heaven is perfect. And He was called the friend of God. Not because He sang the song, but because He lived it. Because He lived it. Verse 24. 
Nothing wrong with singing the song. It's a good song. Let's keep going. Ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. The power of faith and works working together. They cannot be alone. Faith gets lonely without works. Don't let your faith be lonely. Works get lonely without faith. Don't just be busy and not know what you're doing or why you're doing it. That's lonely. Works and faith together. So Abraham, you can read about that in Genesis chapter 22. If he had only had faith and not works, he could have just said, uh, I don't have to go to that mountain, Lord. I know you'll keep Isaac alive. He could have said that. But I don't know how much longer, we, how much more we would have read about Abraham if he had done that, if any. He got up and got moving. The Bible says, uh, actually in Hebrews 11 and in Genesis 22, uh, it talks about how that he didn't even know where God was going to lead him. He just got up and got going. I made a statement on Sunday morning. I said, how's our church going to go to 100? I said, I have no idea. I said, I'm going to try to work to be better and lead better and pastor better and influence better and work with people better and uh, encourage better and motivate better and do everything I can do. But it's going, to, you know, it's going to come through prayer. It's going to come through work and inviting. Of course, that's basic stuff. We understand that. But other than that, I have no idea. I have no idea. I mean, in one year, we've gone from 20s to the mid-50s. I mean, that's a you know, 100% increase or so. Before that, we went from 8 to 30. So that was whatever, 700% or so. And so, you know, we've been on a track upwards, but we want to keep on that track upwards. I don't know how we're going to get to 100. Can this church hold 100? It can. We have all the kids go upstairs immediately rather than waiting with the parents. We just have them go straight to the children's ministry. You have 30 kids upstairs and 70 people down here. That's 100 people. So it can happen, but how's it going to happen? I don't know. I'm going to a land of 100 people that I don't even know how to get there, all right? But God knows. <laughs> that's, what, that's, what, that's just calling things that are not as though they were, okay? And I know it's going to be a teamwork thing. I get that. God's going to add to our team. What were my four W's Winter, that I pray for? Winners, worshipers, workers, and warriors. Remember, I pray for those four kinds of people. I don't just pray God send us people because God will send you people. And remember that net I talked about? You throw them back in the water because, all right? Winners, worshipers, workers, warriors. I'm very specific. And God has given us a team here, thank God. And so therefore, Abraham got up and got going. Didn't even know where he was going, but he knew the God who knew. That's all that matters. All right, verse 25. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? You can read about that in Joshua chapter 2. Rahab the harlot, prostitute. She took in those two spies. She hid them from her government officials. Well, the government says I have to, so I have to. Rahab did not, she didn't think like that. She didn't think. Remember I said earlier, option C. You give an option A and option B and you don't like them, look for option C. <laughs> that brother that said, hey, you want to, what about the uh, repairing of the church van? You want to go to a shop or you want to done it cheap? I said, I want it done right. Option, option C. <laughs> That's the way you got to think something. You got to see, you got to see option C, right? And so the government said, you came to Rahab, you got to tell us where they are. She said, uh, no, I don't. Okay. Yeah. She lied to them. We're not, we're not condoning lying, but yeah, they left. Go chase them. You'll catch up to them. And she had them hidden on her, on her roof the whole time. I'm not saying you should lie. Christians don't lie. She wasn't saved. She was a prostitute. Okay, Christians are not prostitutes. Do I have to say that part? Okay. And so, <laughs> um, but she, we eventually got into the grace of God, okay? And so therefore, she's now remembered as having true faith and works. So Paul, in Hebrews 11, he gives uh, honor and homage to Abraham and Rahab. His half, Jesus' half-brother James, here in James chapter 2, also gives homage to Abraham and Rahab because they did something with their faith. Then he says, for at, verse 26, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Now the body can survive on machines, and you can be alive on a machine, because your spirit is still in your body. But once that spirit is gone, 
They can hook you on a machine. You're not there. The body's functioning because it's a physical, physio it's physiology, stuff pumping through vessels and stuff inside your body. I mean, that's just like water in a water hose. Okay, That's just like that, coming in and going out, coming in and going out. That's nothing, that's not a big, that doesn't make them alive. When the spirit is there, they are alive. When the spirit's gone, the machine can go on. You can keep a body on a machine for probably a couple of centuries if you do it right, I guess. But... That doesn't mean the person's alive. Their soul is departed. And so therefore, he says, just like that, you can have faith, but if you don't have anything with it, it's a dead body. You can have actions, but if you don't know why you're doing it, and you're not doing them for God, it's a dead body. Spiritual corpse. But when we're living the Word of God, the best we know how with God's help, we can then come to realize by experience, Nehemiah 8 and 10, the joy of the Lord is your strength. What is the power of faith and works working together? It isn't just the power of God in your life, though that is certainly it. It is the joy of the Lord being your strength. The happiest people are the busiest people for God. Those are the happiest people. So let's remember to be busy with our faith. Amen. Let's go ahead and bow our heads tonight. Close with prayer. Thank you, Father, for your word. We ask you now, God, to give us a heart to work and to labor, to be busy about your business just like our Lord and Savior because we want to be more like him. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless everybody tonight. Thursday night service is 730.